Hello and welcome to Saints on Cinema. I'm Josh Edlow. And I am Tim Wiles. Sorry, where's the camera? <laughs> Couldn't find the camera. Okay. And that <laughs> completely flawless introduction. We're here today. <laughs> We're professionals. <laughs> we are here tonight to re-engage in our top seven series. This one, underrated sequels. Now, Tim, I uh, had this list. We we'd talked about doing this list a while back, and so I put a list together, and it stayed rather static for a while. And today, mine changed several times, order and also uh, what I put on the list, because it just seemed so hard, because there's so many good sequels out there that I feel don't get their due. Did you kind of see the same thing while you're going through your list? Not at all, because just like when I'm preparing a talk for church or getting a lesson ready or something, I didn't prepare it until like right before we went on the air. So I made my list. And uh, the only thing I had a problem with was trying to, to, to coordinate with you what the list was going to be. Middle parts of a trilogy or last parts of a trilogy. Um, or if we were just going to talk about underrated, like they're underappreciated, which we've talked about that distinction in the past when we did our top seven um, underrated comedies um, episode. But I was trying to figure out if it's just a good sequel that's as good as the first one, or if it's a sequel that just no one likes. And so I was just having a hard time getting a feel on what you were trying to do. But I think I'm, I'm happy with my list. Yeah. So my, I feel like underrated and underappreciated are kind of the same thing. I think there are some... Uh, I just feel like there are movies that don't get the due that I feel that they should get. So, right. Um, okay. So, before, just to be clear, before before we do the list, so, so that's what I did. I ha I have seven that are strictly sequels of a in a pair um, series that <laughs> are just two two movies in the series. I have um, some I pulled off the list when I thought of some others that made it a complete list without having parts of longer movie series. It's, 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 Really? So your list doesn't have anything that goes beyond a part two? Nope. Uh, I know I've got at least no, I've got at least two on there that that have more than one sequel. So before we get into our list, uh, we posted on Facebook and on Twitter kind of our thoughts um, as to what some of the best uh, what, what what our fans' opinions were and some of the ones that came up. Um, a lot were uh, Home Alone 2, Back to the Future 3. Jared Joyner brought those up as well as others. Back to the Future 3. Yeah. <laughs> the sequel is Back to the Future 2, but 3 was a sequel to 2. But I mean, that's the, the concluding part of a long story arc. But that one is very underappreciated. That was a good pick. That is. Yeah, yeah Back to the Future 3. So it's interesting. I think it is a good movie. Part 2 was like up here and Part 3 was kind of down here. So it's not as appreciated. Even in my mind, I don't think I appreciate it as much as I probably you can't, Yeah, you can't watch it without thinking about the other Back to the Future movies. And right. so in comparison, the first two, yeah, it's, it's lower than those two. But compared to regular movies, it's very entertaining, very funny, very well done. Yeah, yeah. I, I can see that one being on the list. Mighty Ducks 2, and uh, <laughs> I don't agree, but on a couple of reasons. <laughs> and what? A couple of points. One, I think Mighty Ducks is way a way better movie, so I don't think Mighty Ducks 2 is underappreciated in that regard. And then also, we did a well, we did okay. a poll, and everybody seemed to agree with Tim that Mighty Ducks 2 is better than the original, so it's obviously not underrated if everyone thinks it's better than the original, which is an excellent movie. So you could put Mighty Ducks 1 on your list of underrated original movies. But, yeah, so, <laughs> but Mighty Ducks 2 is, I mean, I ha, I was going to put that on my list, but again, that was part of a trilogy. The third one is a horrible movie. Um, but the, but Mighty Ducks 2 is, uh, I didn't put it on there, did I? No, I didn't. Um, Mighty Ducks 2 is a great movie, but, but if we hadn't done that poll, I would have put that on my list and did the defense. But your poll made it very clear that it's not underrated because everyone loves it. Yeah, you know, I don't get it. But um, here, here's one that here's one that I thought was a really good pick, and Jared Joyner actually picked this one. Hot Shots Part Two. I thought it was so much better than the original. I thought it was. I, I didn't really like the original that much, but Hot Shots Part Two was funny. Really, funny. I just barely watched those literally last week. For the very first time, both of them. I think I've seen parts of the first one, like years back in the 90s when it first came out. And I never cared about it. And I came across it at Walmart for like five bucks or whatever, or eight bucks. And so I bought the pair and I watched it. And 
I was like, it's okay. And I laughed out loud at a few gags. It'd be fun to do a review of those and some commentary on it. But with it, whether it's better than the first one, I don't, I don't, they're about the same to me. I, I don't know where that would go on my list if it would even hit it or anyone li anyone's list because I just didn't appreciate it at all. I, I, I did. It was okay. They were okay. I remember it's been a long time since I've seen them, but I remember when it came out, I found it incredibly funny and I watched it multiple times. And I did not really think the original was that good. So, uh, definitely, in my mind, underappreciated. Didn't make my list, but is truly an un underappreciated one. Um, Nolan uh, Jones brought up Clerks 2. Now, Tim, I've never seen Clerks 2. I've seen <laughs> the original Clerks, uh, and I th thought it was groundbreaking and, and, and a funny movie, though I wouldn't recommend it for this audience at all. I don't even recommend it. You mean it this one? Um, <laughs> like Clerks yeah. 2. <laughs> Do you agree that Clerks 2 is underrated? Um, I think so. Just by the by way of, I mean, I'm not a big Clerks fan. I saw it once when I was first really learning who Kevin Smith was, and I saw it, and I was like, okay, it's kind of cool. And I understood from some other interviews and commentary I've heard him do talking about uh, Clerks. And again, for our fans, for Saints on Cinema, um, it's they're very R-rated very, for very many reasons. Nothing to go reference you to. Very rated R for a very good reason. But the first one, they're, they're just movies about people working at, well, of course they're working in a convenience store, him or a couple of friends, and they talk about movies and geek stuff and stuff, and that's kind of cool. The reason I like the second one better is because this time they moved the location to a fast food restaurant. And in my my uh, career, there's been off and on times where I spent a lot of times working in a fast food chain, and I can understand and I enjoy a lot of the humor and the stuff that they, that they, uh, they bring out there, talking about customers. That's their niche, is they can talk about customers and and the, the common people who interact with us all the time and really make a good joke out of it. But also the characters really come out more. But not many people talk about Clerks too. but I love it. I love it. Yeah, okay. I, like I said, I've never seen it. Yeah, and that, that's the thing, you know, Clerks, like I said, I mean, when I saw it, I thought it was groundbreaking the way it was done. I thought it was a very funny movie. It was a different time for me in my life. And so I watched it and thought it was great, but I wouldn't recommend it now just because of the raunchiness of it. I wouldn't um, either. Um, a, a, so interesting, uh, a couple other ones that came up. Um, Justin Benning um, mentioned um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. That was actually an honorable mention of mine. I, and I, mine. Okay, yeah. So I think that one doesn't, a lot of people don't like it. Some people actually rank it lower than the Crystal Skull movie, which I <laughs> don't understand that. Um, I thought I grew up on the Temple of Doom. That was one as a kid that I watched the most, and uh, I, I liked it. Yeah, yeah. I th I don't know if it's the the character or the story that people don't like in that movie, just the, the telling of the story, or if it's all the stuff like the and all the the, like the creepy stuff, the golly mom pulling hearts out, and the 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 Indians, it's a village, how impoverished they were, impoverished they were. And, um, you know, eating monkeys' brains and the snakes crawling out of the bigger snake and all that stuff. It was very, you know, eerie, especially for the time. There were no, there was nothing like that in common mo big movies like that. But that didn't mean it was a bad movie. I think that some of the, the, the fun chemistry between Indian Jones and Willie, um, the doctor, the rivalry, the, the, the short round, everyone, you know, makes fun of that, that character. I think short round just a, was a phenomenal sidekick. Um, to go with with Indiana Jones and the chemistry with Willie with you know all three of them were just hilarious. They were so different, but it was a fun adventure. It had a good um, good drive, you know, good beats throughout the whole thing, and it was it was just as good as the other two. It just didn't have all the the Christian religion stuff in it. Maybe that's what alienated people. It was all this Hindu stuff. I don't know if it was Hindu, but the Indian stuff. A couple other ones that were brought up. Um... Uh, Ghostbusters 2, that's actually another one that I would say is an honorable mention of mine. It didn't make my list, um, but I think it's a really good movie, and I think it's not as well-received as some of the other sequels that I've I've seen, but I enjoyed it. Uh, I think it's a big step down from the original Ghostbusters. I think the original Ghostbusters is a much better movie, but it's still very good. Well, what you just said is it's a good movie. I don't think it's a well-done movie. I think it's only entertaining because you're enjoying the the continuation of the characters in the first one. That's it. And that's all I like about it. Now, the last one that I would bring up, uh, I don't even know what this is, but uh, Ben Bramble brought up Atlantis 2. Um, 
I didn't even know they made an Atlantis 2, so it must be kind of... Is that of... a sequel to the cartoon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, you and I were on our missions when that happened. That's how old we are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't... I didn't even really... I can't even remember Atlantis, so... I mean, uh, must be underrated, because I've never even seen it, so... <laughs> I saw when I first got back from my mission, but I didn't, uh, the first one. Um, and I enjoyed it, but I didn't, you know, it's not one I watched over and over or anything. I actually enjoyed it. Maybe that's yeah. something I'll watch with my kids. But anyway, so those are the ones that uh, that we've gone through in, uh, as far as uh, some of the fan um, lists. So Tim, why don't you go ahead and, and start and give us your, uh, your top seven as well as any honorable mentions that we discussed already. All right, all right, all right. I, I'm ready. Let's do this. Okay, right. first one, and now these are not. Let me just say, I'm pretty sure your list is wrong. So let's go ahead. You think even the ones that I have that you also have are wrong? Well, I'm sure they're in a bad order. But anyway, let's go. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> well, I just want to say my order is not specifically in any kind of a, I like this one more than this one more than this one kind of a list, or it's like this one's more underappreciated than this one. I just put them kind of in an order because I like these all for very different reasons. I like these all. I like all of these for, for different reasons. And we don't need to talk about all that, but because I know you're going to cover it and we've already talked about it in our top seven sports movies, but Major League Two. Uh, I think everyone, you know, just loves Major League. And I think there's a couple reasons people don't like Major League Two as much. Number one is because Wesley Snipes didn't come back for it. Um, number two is because it felt like uh, it was a recycled storyline. It was the exact same thing. The rich, whatever the lady's name. I know Josh, you quote everything about this movie, but the, you know, the, the owner came back and she got back involved. Dorn came back and he had to get, you know, get dirty and everything. Um, oh, what's his name? The catcher. What's his name? The main guy. Um, yeah. Yeah, whatever no. it is. yeah. But anyway, but his role wasn't like, you know, trying to be a competitive, trying to get the girl and all that stuff. It turned into, you know, him being a manager. But everything that was great about the first one, say that be Wesley Snipes, was, what, I mean, yeah, they came back, but they did it a little bit better, a little bit cleaner, even to the point of having a good rivalry and having the showdown with the pitching and everything in the end with uh, with Wild Thing. Um, you know, Charlie Sheen reprised the role, and I think it was just a really, really well done. That's my favorite baseball movie. I think it's really fun to watch. It's really funny, and I think, and, you know, they dropped the, that one's not PR, right, if I remember correctly? Speed yeah. So, I mean, that that's another thing. They kind of open it up to more of a family um, audience. But just everything was good about it. The action scene, the montages, the 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 um, the, the action at the end. I mean, well, I'm, I'm teaching my, my son a little bit about Little League and stuff, and I want to watch that movie with him. We just haven't had a chance to. So he can understand kind of some of the exciting things. Now that he understands positions and plays a little bit, he can kind of see some cool stuff. And that's a very fan, or, you know, overly exaggerated circumstances of certain of these baseball plays but it's fun to watch just as good as the first one but no one ever talks about it except you and i i think the my favorite part of that and that's an honorable mention of mine it didn't make the list and, and i kind of wonder if i didn't put it on my list because it was on my underrated comedy list and i didn't want to double up but uh um i i think one of the best parts of major league two is the addition of root um Rube is a really funny. That catcher is a, such a great character addition to the to the story, and uh, he's the one that pulls it together at the end. When he was like, you know, I I love baseball and I just want to play baseball. And there was probably a time when you guys did too, and they all had to like think about putting aside all their stupid crap that was like you know preoccupying them from actually playing the game, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good one. It's a good honorable mention. Good. Glad you approve. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna put uh, the next one. Weekend at Bernie's two. Uh, I'll say, <laughs> I saw the first one as a kid on television, and I saw the second one actually. I remember as a kid also in the movie theater. Now the thing is with Weekend at Bernie's, the premise is absolutely ridiculous. Okay, no one can watch Weekend at Bernie's without or, you know and take it seriously, but. When it was all done, the body was, you know, it was revealed that Bernie died and they were, you know, the, the, con the conspiracy with the money was over and they were they were free from the police and they cleared their name. They took down the bad guys and everything. Everything was wrapped up at the end of Weekend at Bernie's. If they were going to move in and capitalize on that, which was years later on that on that plot, there was no way that it could have been done better to make it believable that they actually brought this body out of the morgue, continuing on with the, the voodoo stuff that they didn't know was going on, where it was dancing to the music and everything. 
have another reason to take it and to you know keep the body animated, pretending it was alive, and to have these characters going into more you know romantic circles and their their little uh, adventures together. That I, I love, you know, um, Larry and uh, Richard. I think they're phenomenal characters. I wish, even if they wasn't with Bernie, you know, Bernie was a great actor in that movie. Um, they did more with those characters. It was just fun to watch them. You know, I could, I would enjoy watching like a series like Office Space or something with these characters. It'd just be really fun. But they brought it back, and it was just as funny as the first one, just as ridiculously believable, and it was well executed. It didn't. It wasn't like okay, they're just doing the same thing over and over. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was a good movie. I didn't even really think about it. It didn't make my list, but it's it's a good one. So. Yeah. The other one I don't think people appreciate is Grumpier Old Men. That's the oh, third one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love Grumpy Old Men. A lot of people love Grumpy Old Men, but the, the, all the magic the, and the, the chemistry between uh, the Jack Lennon and uh, Matt, oh, Walter... Walter Matthau. Yeah. yeah. That they that where they, they tied up their friendship and everything at the end of the first one, that gave them more reason to be bitter at each other and to be pulling pranks on each other. And then they were unified and pulling pranks on uh, upon the uh, the Italian lady that's trying to open up the restaurant, Restaurante. And that they they had a reason to bring it all back. And then Burgess Meredith, his last movie, from what I, if I remember right, um, you know, we're all in there. And it was just as witty and funny and all the ad libbing that they did that I love that they show that during the credits, the outtakes. That they brought it back and had another story just as believable and just as just as heartwarming with the family stuff that, that you know they're coming together the double weddings and all that stuff. No one appreciates that movie, but it's really funny and it was fun seeing those characters outside of the winter where it was in the summertime, and it was just as good. Did yeah, you like that I, one? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's underrated. I don't think it's uh, it's necessarily it's not as good as the original. It's a good movie, but I I don't know. I don't know if it's necessarily underrated. Well, then between the two of us, it's obviously underrated because it was a very good movie. I think it's one that's often forgotten. That's a good movie. It's under certainly underappreciated, underrated. I don't know. So, All right. Well, right. that's fine. Um, I mentioned this one in our in our top seven high school movies, and I'm going to say it again. Um, Sister Act 2. Uh, I love Sister Act 2. I, I don't know if it's just the characters or it's the music. That's not just the same typical, um, the, the choir and everything. But I love the fun story. And they're just doing a lot of things to boost the morale of these kids. And that's what makes it a great high school movie. I, th I think I love watching the diversity of all these kids, you know, living in the ghetto with not a lot of optimism in their lives and their education and everything, but still coming together because of um, Dolores's... Uh, her influence and the passion she has for music that inspires them. And then they accomplish something great. Everyone loves the first one. I and mean, a lot of people don't even like those movies, but a lot of people love the first one. I don't hear a lot of people that talk about the second one as much at all. Yeah. The, the first one is a fantastic movie. I love it. Second one, I could, I wish they wish I would have never done it, but I, I think you need to watch it again. I you watched it not too long ago. We came on TV and I watched about 20 minutes of it. And I was like, yeah, I mean, Okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I get emotional. I, I cry every time at the end when they have the contest after a big musical number and then they actually win. I always get emotional on that one. That's one of the movies that if I watch the whole thing all the way through, I'll cry. That's, I'm not embarrassed by that. I don't care. I already mentioned it, but Home Alone 2. Now, as I mentioned, my list was not um, any part of a longer series than two movies. Um, but Home Alone 2, as far as I'm concerned, concluded the story and all the other, you know, they made like four or five of them, whatever. They're all recycled and stupid stories and it's ridiculous they are not the same characters even though one of the sequels even had a kevin and it was supposed to be canonized as like younger kind of like the honey i shrunk the kids they just had to keep recasting characters and we're like oh we had like seven more kids later or whatever all garbage but the um that movie was really good. I really enjoy Home Alone 2 just as much as the first one. And same thing, if you're gonna you know, put off your or your suspension of disbelief enough to uh, enjoy Home Alone, the first one, that same situation happened. They gave a good excuse for him to be alone in New York. And the only really horribly convenient part was that he had the uncle that, was, that he didn't know very well that was renovating a house that was vacant right close to where he was you know, in uh, New York. That was the only really, really bad, convenient plot hole, but or plot point. 
But the rest of it was enjoyable, and I'm sorry, but I think some of the gags, my favorite gag in all of those movies, is the bricks when they're when he's when they're throwing the or he's throwing the bricks on him and keeps hitting uh, Harry. Um, that's one of the funniest things. His uh, taking those uh, hits is uh, one of the funniest things in any movie I've ever seen. I cannot watch that without laughing hysterically every single time, no matter how many times I've seen that movie. And it's a lot of fun. You have Tim Curry and everyone in there. Um, it's just a phenomenal movie, and everyone just hates the second one, loves the first one. A lot of people would like both of them, but I don't know anybody. One, I agree with you. I think that the the ending sequence, the sequence where they're actually chasing him, is so much better in the second one than it is in the first one. Mm -hmm. The higher, the gags are funnier. The bricks, that's absolutely the funniest part of any of the two movies of either of the two. <laughs> and also, so great. So I think that the entirety of the movie in part one was a better movie and more well done. I think that generally all of that, I think the number one, number one is from front to back a better movie, but I think the sequel yeah. in part two where they're chasing him through the renovated house is funnier than the sequence in part one. I agree. And you're right. There's a lot, it's a lot more intense when they take him out because they capture him and they take him out of the park and now he's by himself. You know, there's no, you know, the old man's not going to come in with his uh, shovel again. And they pull out a gun and they're like actually talking about how they're going to murder the kid. Now they did in the first one. He said, I'm going to bite off all of his little fingers when they finally grabbed him and put him on the hook, on the coat hook. But you know, both of those movies get really intense, right? Just for a moment. And then they're revealed. I'll just say one thing. I do like the old man neighbor in the first one better than the crazy bird lady in the second one. She was okay. Right. But as a character, I, I much more like the, the little story arc with the first guy. She, it was just she was just still in the field at the end. I mean, there was no arc for her. She came and saved him, and then she went back to her birds. and And Kevin, this rich kid, didn't it didn't show any closure or anything that happened. At least in the first one, the old man, you know, had his family come over, and he, you know, he did something. He changed a little bit. So anyway, that was uh, third from the last. Um, the next one, I think someone mentioned this one, I believe, but Gremlins Two. Mm. As a kid, I watched Gremlins 2 way more than I saw the first one. I didn't like the first one, but what I like more about Gremlins 2, other than all the cameos, including Hulk Hogan, is that Gremlins 2 had all of the, the different entities and different personalities of the Gremlins. There wasn't just Spike, I remember, it was, or Stripe or Spike, whatever it was in the first one, the, 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 um, the Alpha Gremlin, and then all the other ones were all the exact same. This one had the Alpha, who, played, who, was the, um, who became the Spider later, if I remember. And then, but there was the brain, there was the gargoyle one, there was the goofy one, and they all did the girl one. They all went and did different things with all the the, the lab um, vials, all the chemicals that they were drinking, the experimental stuff. They gave them all different quirks or mutations and stuff. But that was fun watching them and watching them take over the building and everything. I think that was a lot more uh, more fun to do with the Gremlins instead of this horror style movie of the first one. This one was more of a, an adventure, a comedy adventure than the first one, which was more of a kind of a thriller kind of a thing that they were going for. Um, I think that made it more fun for me to watch as a kid. And I watched them both recently and I was like, I love this movie. I really do. And not a lot of people really praise the second one as much. Yeah, uh, my list, but I can see how you can make an argument for it. I think it is underappreciated, underrated. Just didn't make my list, so. All right. Well, before I give you my last one, and I'm Last going one. to. Wait, how many have you given? One, two, three, four, five, six. That was six. What? I thought yeah. the other one honorable mentions. Well, I, do, I was about to say, I'm going to give you my honorable mentions. Oh, those were not honorable mentions. Okay. That was my list. How many honorable mentions did you think I had? All right. Go ahead. Would you think I was just going to go on for like, like talk about 20 movies, including no, my I list? Thought, I thought the first few were your honorable mentions. Go ahead. That's no. all right. Well, if our audience got confused as well, I apologize. But my last, before my last one, these are my honorable mentions. Josh, right here, this segment is called Tim's Honorable Mentions. Okay. All right. Temple of Doom was on there, but we already talked about that. Um, I'm going to say Iron Man 2. A lot of people, a lot of people don't like the third one, but a lot of people don't like the second one. And I don't understand that. I think the second one, as far as it being, a, a, as far as a movie, I would put that. I put that in my top seven uh, Marvel um, or Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. I think the second one has a much more interesting story arc with Tony. I like the Stark in the first one better. I mean, that arc is 
is a lot uh, more simplistic and it's a lot more it's, it's deep but this one is just as good where he's like facing death the thing that's saving it that saved his life is now killing him something they completely just just erase in the third movie just out of convenience to before they roll the credits but in this one you have a villain and i love the, the russian whatever his name was i love him so much i don't remember his name whiplash or whatever he uh his his character was established with his motive and everything all in the opening montage where at the same time of this movie they told the story of the first one they caught you up with with li him listening while he's in russia um listening to the news re re release of uh, the press conference where tony um, revealed himself as iron man at the end of the first movie all that he was doing that with really good music while you're watching this this bitter russian who just watched his father die who's now engineering his own version of the arc reactor after we just saw a whole movie of how all these scientists couldn't rebuild the arc reactor, only Tony could do it. And now we see this Russian who's doing it, so you know he's super smart, and then he ha he's very powerful and he's very upset, and then you see him whip into action on the when he's doing the racing scene where he comes out with his, with his power whips. And it's really awesome. You get to see Iron Man doing really cool stuff as Iron Man with new suits that are interesting before they became ridiculous. And it was just really cool. It was a lot of fun stuff that happened. And then his um, coping with it, the introduction of Hammer and um, the um, War Machine, putting his suit on and them fighting together. That ending sequence was the coolest Iron Man stuff they've done in any of the movies, if you ask me. I love it. And everyone always bags on that movie. I don't know why. I don't know why that's not everyone's favorite Iron Man movie. Yeah, I don't I wouldn't say it's my favorite Iron Man movie, but I enjoyed it. I, I agree if people are bagging on it. I haven't really heard a lot of people bag on it, but it, you know, that doesn't mean you know, maybe I'm not paying attention. Um, but I I enjoyed it, so I can see why you would think that's underrated. Um, but anyway, that one, that was one of my honorable mentions. Batman Returns. As far as I'm concerned, Batman Returns was the end of the, that series. Batman Forever and Batman Be or Batman Ron was just a, you know, a con flurry and continuation of the franchise. But Batman Returns, no one likes, a lot of people don't like that movie. Really? Maybe because it's a lot darker. You've never heard people complain about any of these? No, I've never heard people complain about Batman Returns. I've heard them talk about Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. Cause those, oh, are those are bad movies, but no one likes it. I don't know if it's because it's too dark, because they were going to murder little kids, or the penguin was too creepy, or any of those things. I mean, it was before they got too weird with the, with the suit, but... I think those are the things that make it great. It was, yeah. you know, a continuation of Tim Burton's involvement. It was a continuation of, um, oh, what's his name that did the soundtrack? Um, I don't know who did the soundtrack, but Danny DeVito was a fantastic yeah. penguin. And Michelle yeah. was the best Catwoman. Oh my gosh. Catwoman. So just yeah no one wasn't in love with or everyone was in love with her um danny elfman who did the music that was his continuing for that soundtrack and there's really intense storyline the circus you got to see batman do some cool stuff the batmobile doing some cool stuff and it was just really good it was really good action really good story arc and you got selena kyle and when i fell in love with selena kyle and catwoman separately and it was just really good it was a good continuation of the same character from the first one i didn't have any problems with it but everyone always hates that movie. I don't know why. I mean, I, I don't know. I guess you don't hear as many people complain about these movies as much, as much as I do. But no one appreciates it that well. I think it's definitely overrated, underrated. <laughs> um, but my number one, those were two, my two, uh, my three, if you include Temple of Doom, my three honorable mentions. But number one, Crocodile Dundee 2. Interesting. Everyone has forgotten about the Crocodile Dundee movies until the last Super Bowl commercial where um, Paul Hogan was in there talking or making that joke or whatever. But uh, Crocodile Dundee, I just watched this last month, and I've always liked these two movies. But Crocodile Dundee um, was a fun movie, and Paul Hogan actually wrote that character. He wrote the story. And it's kind of like Stallone, you know, writing Rocky. It's just something he was passionate about and he wanted to do. But it was such a beloved character. Everyone loved Crocodile Dundee. Everyone thought it was so cool watching the fish out of the water story with him. Well, both sides, because you have her in Australia in the first one. And then she's out of water and then just trying to, to learn about his lifestyle. And then she brings him to New York and now you're seeing him out of water in the in the inverted um, circumstances. And it's just fun watching him interact with New Yorkers and stuff like that. Well, the second movie does it again, but they flip it. But now you're seeing him up against like terrorists and stuff like that. It wasn't just some stupid news report and she's getting married to some some jerk and and uh, and he's trying to cope with that and then them falling in love 
very awkwardly. The second one was where there were where was a, a crime syndicate that was trying to hunt him down, and because they're trying to re, or take care of the witness that died in the beginning, which was her ex husband. But the story was so enjoyable, and the twist, the music was really good. The cinematography, you didn't know what he was doing all the time. The footage of um, Australia, wherever they filmed it, um, supposed to be Australia. But it was just really well done, and she got intense. They had the Aborigines back again that were, you know, doing a different thing. The jokes were really good, and you got to see um, Crocodile Dundee as just dominant. It's just like when you saw Rocky and Rocky Five when they went out of the the bar at the very end to have the the fight. It was like, okay, now you get to see Rocky on his terms, and that was awesome. That was like one of the favorite fights because of that. This one was the same thing, only it was like a, a, an hour long of watching Crocodile Dundee just messing with these terrorists trying to follow them as they were a bunch of fish out of water. And he was just taking them out one by one, capturing them and taking it down to the very last guy who was head over it. And just doing his thing, just, just in total control of his environment. But it got kind of tense too. It wasn't just, uh, just so easy for him. It was just so enjoyable. Such a good movie. No one appreciates it. Yeah, Crocodile Dundee, you know, it's, uh, I remember the original, um, my parents really liked it. I was a little young to see it, I think, or appreciate it when I, when they were watching it. I did watch it later and thought it was good. I don't remember really if I even saw Crocodile Dundee 2. Is it R-rated or is it PG-13? Uh, oh boy, we need to watch it. We need to watch it. Is it, is it PG-13? I think so. Okay. I'll have the... I will definitely watch it. So it is so great. I don't want to ruin it. Yeah, it's not R. PG PG. Oh great. Yeah. I'll the first one was thirteen. The second one's PG. So they even did a better movie with a lower rating. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I, I think I want to watch the original again. Now that you brought that up, that's a good one to go back and watch. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, good list. Nothing I necessarily totally disagreed with, although. Which one did I totally disagree? Oh, Sister Act 2. That shouldn't be on any day. <laughs> Terrible. Such a good movie. But you said the same thing about Mighty Ducks too. So I don't really care about what you don't think is a good movie. Okay. Well, I didn't think say it was a, wasn't a good movie. I just said it wasn't as good as the original. But anyhow. Okay. Well, so you did my, say Ghostbusters 2 is a good movie. So I'm still questioning your judgment. I think it's very underrated. I enjoyed the movie. Underrated, yes. But a good movie, you said. Twice. Uh, okay. All right. Well, let's move <laughs> Let's, what I'm going to do, uh, so okay. number seven, Ghoulies 2. Have you ever seen the Ghoulies movies? No, I've never seen them. I've seen people, a lot of people have been talking about it a lot on shows I watch, but I've never actually sat and watched them. Okay, and we're so, not talking about Critters. This, this is no, something else. No, I've never seen any of those. Critters is also another good one. These all came out around the same time as Gremlins. When Gremlins took off, these are kind of similar to that, and they're little creature horror type films. But this is a movie that... The original Ghoulies focuses around a young man who goes to his family mansion and finds that his father had kind of uh, some paraphernalia from the occult. And so they summon these demonic forces, which are these little Ghoulies. And the most iconic part about Ghoulies is if you've ever gone to the movie theater when you were a kid, you probably saw the uh, you probably saw the uh, the box where it has the Ghoulie coming out of the toilet, right? And that was kind of the the thing that was kind of scary because I don't know if you ever had a fear of something nope. in the toilet. Okay, well, anyway, nope. uh, so <laughs> so that was the. It's more of like a horror comedy film. Anyway, Ghoulies Two doesn't really have a lot to do with the original. Basically, the Ghoulies kind of end up hitching a ride um, with some carnies and end up in a amuse an amusement park. And they get into this fun house, and people are coming through, and they're attacking people in the fun house. But people who come through, it becomes this big hit because people think it's actually part of the the funhouse and don't realize that they're actually real monsters trying to hurt people. So it's a it's a really great movie. I think it's underrated. I think it's just as good, if not better, than the first. So do I need to watch the first one before I watch the second one? You don't, but I think it would. It's a it's an origin story. So I mean. You should, and they come right now on Blu-ray together. So if you purchase the Blu-ray, you get them both. So yeah, I only have a few Blu-ray. I'm probably not going to start with that one to continue my collection. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you get the DVDs in a two-pack because nobody's really trying to buy one or the other. That you <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> That's my number seven. Okay, uh, my number six, Vegas Vacation. 
So everyone knows National Lampoon's vacation. Everyone knows National Lampoon's Christmas vacation. Um, there's also National Lampoon's European vacation, which was part two of the three. Uh, part two was okay. I didn't think it was as great. Somebody actually mentioned European vacation as underrated. I don't personally think it's underrated, but Vegas vacation is highly underrated. This is Chevy Chase taking his family to Las Vegas. And Wasn't that one done like years and years later and when no one really cared about it anymore? Well, yeah, pretty much. I mean, it, it had been a long time since Christmas Vacation had come out. And so this comes out and I find it hilarious. There's a scene where uh, the mom is totally in love with, um, uh, with Wayne Newton. He's gambling all over the place, gambling all their money away. Cousin Eddie lives in Vegas now. He was given a government, a piece of government property where he lives with all of his kids and Catherine. He is a much bigger part of the story, which makes it great. Randy Quaid does a great job with the character. If you haven't seen Vegas Vacation, you should see it because it's a great, great, funny, hilarious movie. So, Can I confess, I've never seen any of them except for Christmas Vacation. Well, that's certainly a confession because National Lampoon's Vacation is hilarious. I mean, hilarious. European Vacation is good. I, well, I wouldn't say it's good. It's okay. I don't particularly like it that much. And obviously everyone, Christmas Vacation has become a staple of most people's Christmas catalog of movies that they watch at the time. You got to see- That's the only one anyone ever talks about is Christmas Vacation. I, I honestly didn't even know there was other movies, that there were other movies until like, I was like 20 when I actually learned that there were other movies. and. And uh, I didn't hear much about them. Like no one, I don't know if people like bagged on them, but like no one cared about them except for Christmas Vacation. Yeah, National Lampoon's Vacation is a great, great movie. We've kind of put National Lampoon's on the map. So, um, but Vegas Vacation is another one that I think is just a great movie, great film to watch. And the cameo where the where the family flies into the Death Star battle on the Family Guy Star Wars special, um, Blue Harvest. Clark, I don't like the look of this neighborhood. Come on, Ellen. It's important for the kids to witness the plight of the rebellion. Kids, you noticing all this plight? Roll them up. You should watch Vegas Vacation for sure. You'll you'll appreciate it if you've just seen Christmas Vacation. So okay, and you should watch Blue Harvest if you've never seen the <laughs> Guy Star Wars specials. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but that's okay. All right. Um, so my next one uh, is Be Cool. Have you ever seen Be Cool? Be Cool? Yeah. No. Okay. So Is that the sequel to Be Lame? <laughs> no, it's actually the sequel to a movie called Get Shorty back in 1995. Uh, oh, I know that. I never saw it, but I know what it is. Yeah. So John Travolta plays a mobster who goes to Hollywood to collect a debt. And when he goes there, he realizes that the movie industry is very similar to the mob and how they work. And so he decides to leave his mobster ways and become uh, part of the movie business. Be Cool is the sequel with John Travolta. It also has Vince Vaughn, The Rock, Uma Thurman, Steven Tyler from Aerosmith is in it. Um, Cedric the Entertainer is in it. Andre 3000 is in it. Uh, so a, a good all-star cast, but here he gets tired of the movie industry and decides to move into the music business. And uh, he decides to do that when one of his friends is Murder, who is a music executive, and Uma Thurman is the widow. Uh, Vince Vaughn, Vince Vaughn uh, plays this hilarious uh, uh, henchman, and he has a bodyguard who's The Rock, and who plays a Samoan gay man who's trying to break into the mo movie business. What and year was this? This was in, I want to say, 2000... Um, 2002, 2003, I think is when it came out. Okay. Really great stuff. So you should see it. If you haven't seen it, you should go. I recommend you see it. It's PG-13. Get Shorty's rated R, so I wouldn't recommend going and seeing that particularly. But Be Cool is a great, even just to watch Vince Vaughn and The Rock and their, you know, their back and forth uh, is just, it's a great movie. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'll, I'll have to tell our listeners I'm not going to see Get Shorty and then see it and then come back and watch it. A great movie. I recommend it for anybody who has right, it. I'll check it out. That'll have to be in our epilogue episode. Yeah, so, okay, my next one, Rocky 2. Now, what? Rocky 2? 
<laughs> now here's why I chose Rocky two. Because uh, it's not as good as Rocky three, so therefore very underappreciated. I agree. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> so here's why I, I I picked this Rocky movie. Um, everybody kind of agrees that Rocky three and Rocky four, although the order is, is changes even in my own mind sometimes, is way up there because of Drago and Mr. T. Everyone loves the original Rocky because it's the original. People like Balboa. Everybody agrees that Rocky Five is the, even though it's, I still think it's a good movie, is the the least favorite of all of them. If Rocky, I was doing a series, I would say Rocky Five is the most underappreciated and underrated uh, Rocky movie. So I don't think so because I still think, even though it is underappreciated and it is a good movie, it does belong in that bottom slot of all the movies. Do you know but, why? Is because you are in love with Carl Weathers, and that's the only one that doesn't have any reference to him. I'm sorry, whose list is this? Okay, so... <laughs> so Rocky, you didn't deny it, though. <laughs> so, Rocky II does not get much play. I mean, it's no. it's never really discussed. And it's a great continuation from the first one. And it's so believable to have somebody like that who's never had money, he comes into money, he has this great, you know, this, this great story. Everybody loves him. He's got a 15 minutes of fame. And then he goes back to the real world. He blows all of his money marrying Adrian and trying to buy a house and buying all these new things because he's never been able to do it before. And he's then totally tasteless in his purchases, just for the record. Very 80s. Well, it was in the 80s, so I guess that would make sense. So <laughs> we have that part. Um, and then he gets another shot. And this time he gets a shot to win. And the cool thing about this is in the first movie, you see that Rocky has fought uh, Apollo Creed. Apollo Creed hadn't really taken him seriously, so he didn't get Apollo Creed at his best. Although, in the movie, and it's one of my favorite scenes of the whole thing, they go to the hospital, and Rocky actually goes to Apollo Creed's room, and he opens him up and says, hey, did you give me your best? And he says, yes, I did. But the thing is, is he didn't really train. He didn't take him seriously at the beginning. He took him seriously after he was the first person to ever knock him down, right? He knocks him down in the first round. But he wasn't, he didn't train really hard for the movie. So, or uh, for the movie. For, for the, the fight, yeah. Right. So <laughs> Probably now, both. Right. So now in Rocky II, Apollo Creed is, he's the one chasing Rocky. He wants to get him back in there because he said it was a fluke. And... Rocky gets a chance to beat him and does. Uh, and then you get what I think is probably the most iconic, the icon, the most iconic uh, uh, quote of the whole series. Yo, Adrian, I did it. That comes from Rocky two and people don't really talk about it much. I don't know why. The whole like, Adrian, that's what they all say. He doesn't say it like that in the first movie when he's calling for her because she's there at the uh, at the arena, and she he's like Adrian, Adrian. But he doesn't say it like everyone when they mock it, and then it is. It's in the second one when when he says Yo, Adrian, and, but they don't say the rest. Or he says I did it. That's one of the most misquoted um, uh, lines ever in any movie. Yeah, and I also love this. There, you know, now he's kind of a local celebrity. So when he's doing the training sequence, he's running down. He's running up the. He's running up the steps. Uh -huh. He's got kids chasing him, and it's a really cool uh, deal. So I think that one is highly underappreciated, not because people don't like it, but because it's never really mentioned when people are talking about their favorite. And I, I think it. people don't appreciate it as much. I, I think you're right, and I love the second movie. It's not the one I watched the most. I mean, of all of them, I watched one the least, sorry, and I watched two the second least. And, and I think, you know, we've already talked about many times, Rocky Three is my favorite Rocky movie. Rocky IV has my favorite fight, and Rocky V has my other favorite fight. Well, I guess, yeah, my favorite fight's in five. My favorite uh, match in in the ring is in four, in four, and training sequences in four. Rocky I is a lot of drama, and that you know, that's why, as far as Rocky movies, that's why I don't like it. That's a great movie, not a good Rocky movie. Rocky II is a great continuation. Like you're talking about the heat between Al uh, Apollo and, and Balboa. At the very end of the first one, he's like, ain't gonna be no rematch, ain't gonna be no rematch. But by the time they got in the ambulance and drove to the hospital, he's now fired up and he's really upset because of all the, the media and everything in his face. And so he goes and while they're in the, the uh, wheelchairs and he starts calling out Balboa right there, ready to finish it right there in the waiting in the emergency room. And then they get in their bed and after he's cooled off for a couple of days and they're freaking healing for weeks, then that's when he goes into his room and says, did you give me your best? He's like, yeah. 
and he's like he's contemplating because he like tried his hardest but he didn't get the victory and that's what he tells his wife i beat him but i didn't win and that's that's what brings it back because rocky's only goal was like to not be beaten or he didn't expect to win but just to not be beaten that's what he did he did it and he went the rounds with him and then he had to he wanted to beat him in the second one but you're right the story the relationship between him and adrian the relationship with him and mickey him trying to reconvince mickey to train him i mean i could go on 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 about it but the montage the excitement the the training when when mickey's like let's do it or whatever when he when she came out of the coma after they had the baby all that stuff was all this drive to get him into the ring with the audience we're so excited to see him now we're ready to watch him win good rocky movie man and a couple other things um first, first the the drama of them both going down and trying to beat the count that was really awesome and i love the the scene where apollo even Duke, is like yeah you know, he they, there's that moment where apollo creed is talking to duke and duke's looking at him He's all wrong for us. I saw you hit him with everything, and the man just kept coming. You know, and yeah, like he, I saw you hit him. Like I've never seen you hit anyone, and and he, the man kept coming. He's like, we don't need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that was the. It's one of the movies where I love the movies with imperfect villains, right? And you can see that Apollo has his own story arc and his own motivations. He's not a bad guy. You know what I mean? He's not a bad guy. He's not a villain. Even though he represents everything that's standing in Rocky's way, he's not a villain. He's an obstacle. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we've had a we could go a whole hour just on Rocky Two, I'm sure. Okay, my next one, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Um, I don't think this gets a lot of play. I've heard a lot of people say that they really thought it was terrible. I didn't think it was terrible. I thought it was a good movie. I love death. I love the characters are so fun. I thought it was very. Um, creative the way that they did everything the board games with death were hilarious um i just overall thought it was a great continuation of the story and if, if we haven't already announced this um you know and if you haven't already seen um they are making a new bill and ted movie so i'm very interested to see how they're going to play off of what happened at the end of part two and bogus journey uh what did you think of bogus journey well, I love it. And while you were talking, that was on my list originally, but then I think some other people had mentioned it too. But um, critics gave it 54 and audience gave it 56. Now, I just watched these recently as well. And I, uh, I like it. I love the characters. I think it could have been done a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> I think it was, I think it was fun. I enjoy the characters. I like seeing them back. I like the idea that just because they, they beat their, um, they, they did their paper and Rufus came back, gave them their guitars and everything. They had the girls and everything. It was all wrapped up. And they, but he was, that was the end of the first movie. He was like, you know, nothing's changed. Here we are still sitting in our garage. And then Rufus came in with the girls and the guitars. That doesn't just solve everything. You know, a lot of times you watch a movie and like all the magic of that story wraps up. And you're like, oh, now they live happily ever after and there were no other real life situations. Well, now they did. They had to go to school. They had to like, work. They had to get a job. They had to get or to or to uh, propose. They had to maintain an apartment that wasn't trash, you know. And they had these these drives that normal people their age go through. But just because in the future they're going to be uh, rock legends and save the universe or whatever, doesn't change their day to day life here. I love the idea that they they went and, and dove into that a little bit. The robots were kind of weird. Um, it was really cool seeing them and going to heaven and everything was hilarious. I love everything with uh, death, like you said. The only disappointment I have was the way they wrapped everything up in the encounter at the end was just a little lazy. Like there, there was no fight. There, it could have been a fight between the robot usses and the evil robot usses, you know. They, it was. It could have been really cool, but it was just kind of like they walk up and punch him. Okay, that's over. And then the bad guy comes in. He has a gun. Like, oh no, we are going to time travel and have a magnet. Now, now we won. You know, it's like it was lazy. It was really lazy. The wrap up. That's the only thing I don't like about it. Everything leading up to it was great, and I love the story. I love the concept. And again, this is one where if you're going to reimagine characters like this, they did it well. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I. I agree, and um, I think that part of the reason why I love Bogus Journey so much is because I have a real uh, love for the original Excellent Adventure. I, in fact, tonight I just watched that with my kids, and it was the first time that my two youngest saw it, and they all loved it. And it's just, it's universal. It stands the test of time. Great music, um, just an all, overall great movie. And I'm really bummed that they're doing the movie now with uh, George Carlin being dead. 
Uh, I wish that he could somehow come back for this, and I hope they pay homage to him in the third one. So yeah. But, well, but, can I just say that I tried watching with my kids, and they hadn't wouldn't have anything to do with it. Wow. My kids are lame. Yeah, they did. They wouldn't even sit through it. I tried. Wow, that's too bad. Yeah. Well. Well, I mean, that, that does say something about the parenting, but. Uh, <laughs> Okay, my number two, Adam's Family Values. Now, I love Adam's Family Values. I think that this movie is hilarious. I think it's just as good as the first movie. So here in the end of the first movie, you can see that uh, Uncle Fester actually was Uncle Fester the whole time. And this movie is about Uncle Fester wanting to find love. And he finds love through a crazy serial killer woman who has the plan of blowing him up but somehow can't and then also they for some reason decide to send the kids to summer camp and hilarity ensues there um i think this movie does not get anywhere near the credence it deserves i think it's really fun I, in a lot of ways i laughed harder at this one than i did the original so yeah i think i know why it doesn't get the credence it deserves I think it's because it doesn't deserve any credence. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like it at all. Even as a kid watching it when it first came out, I was like, oh, it's going to be awesome. And it had the MC Hammer song and everything. And I was like, this is going to be great. I love the first one. I think the first one's great. My favorite part of the first one was the, the fighting song that they uh, fester and, um, um, oh my gosh, Raul Julia's character, whatever the main guy is. Gomez. But Gomez. <laughs> Anyway, you know, there's their song and dance and they're sword fighting, trying to kill each other and everything, trying to, you know, Fester trying to, you know, get into the jive of how the, the Adams live their lives and everything. And then when they're out in the real world and they all have like real jobs and stuff, it was a lot of fun. This one, they tried to do that with the camp and everything. But I was just like, this is just a dumb story, just as an excuse to, it was to cash in on it. It was, I did not enjoy it. I didn't think it was funny. As a kid, I don't even think I sat through the whole thing. I was that bored. I well, did just to get to the Adams Valley or the, the Adams Family rap at the end of it, but I was like, this movie was dumb. As okay. a kid, I'm easily entertained as a kid. Well, first of all, let me just say that I don't think anyone who can't even remember the name Gomez Adams when talking about the Adams Family does not uh, deserve a say in which movie's better than the other. But I knew Raul Julia's character or name. Oh, oh well, okay, there you go. But that's because he was in Street Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, which we're going yeah. another underappreciated <laughs> list one day. Classic. Yeah, please. Okay, so Adam Sally Values, in my mind, is hilarious. I think, um, I can't remember who it is who plays Debbie, what her name is. Um, oh, you can't remember? I don't know. Yeah. Joan Cusack. That's who it was. Joan Cusack. She plays a great job, does a great job in this. Christina Ricci, obviously, does a great job as Wednesday. And there's so much. I think the the my favorite parts come from the camp scene with the kids because they're just everyone else is so cheery and they are so dark and they're so funny yeah. where she's pretending to be friendly just to be able to play pocahontas in the uh in, in the thanksgiving play only to destroy the whole play was hilarious so i love that movie you want to know um, my favorite parts of the movie both no, of them it's going to be something it's going to be something ridiculous that you're going to say no it was uh, morticia Angelica and Angelica Houston was just gorgeous as that goth writer for you know. I was just like, wow. Their, and their romance, their passion for each other between Gomez and Marticia was just. Oh, as a kid, I was like, that. That's the goal right there. That's the goal to be the Adams family. Great. <laughs> no, just just have that loyal, that much love and dedication. I just yeah. anyway, I oh. love Angelica Houston. All right. Well, um, so that was my number two. Now let me get into my uh, my. You uh, gave six already. I did I did six? I went through them. Okay, well, I'm not gonna ask you to do a recount like you did me, but go ahead. Yeah, you'll see it when you're editing, if you. Edit. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> all right. So honorable mentions. First one, Wayne's World Two. I like the. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You're not a Wayne's World fan. I agree with you. In the I fact love Wayne's that, World. You're wrong. Okay, so who's listening? To this? All right, so Wayne's World Two, uh, I like it a lot. I think it's funny. I think the addition of Chris Farley to this movie was hilarious. Also, the addition of the uh, the crazy old Brody was hilarious as well. Um, I 
I thought it was a great continuation. I do agree with you, Tim, that when you say that you don't think that Wayne's World necessarily stands the test of time as well as some other movies because it's really 90s specific. And to really get the humor, you kind of have to have lived the 90s. I think that Wayne's World, that series is probably the most successful of, the, of SNL. Maybe a close second was Coneheads. Um, but I think the Wayne's World, uh, that that whole series is great, and I thought Part Two is a great uh, addition to the. To the I series. love the character. I love the first movie. Everything about the first movie. But I think what was successful about it that made that made it in a way timeless is the the situations were fun, and a lot of people in the '90s could either relate to it or looked up to it. Like as a kid, I was like, "That's what I want. I can't wait to be in high school and just cruise around with my friends, rock, or not rocking out." But like listen to music and singing and going to going to have a donut and going over to this club and hang out meeting people. I thought that was the life. And, and I know they weren't in high school, but that's why as a as a kid, that's what I was looking at. Like, wow, this is gonna be awesome. And then uh, if you think about you know at the time what public access was, what their show, what what they were doing is exactly what we're doing now. And I've heard other people comment on this recently too. That uh, that was that was a the sh a show about people living their dream, just putting out their own content for free. That's what public access was. Where now, anyone can do that on YouTube. And it's a lot of fun to be able to do. We have Tim and Josh's world right now. You know, it's freaking cool. But the second one was like, well, we're going to freaking do this really weird twist. There weren't as funny jokes. They were the characters and their interactions with other people wasn't as funny. And they were getting all mystical and having dead people and do Wayne stock. And it was just such a dumb plot. I was just so disinterested and not entertained by the characters. That's what's timeless was the characters. It's I don't agree. I think there were some really funny parts in the second one. Um, you know, I agree that it's not as good as the first, but I think that if you, you should watch it again and see because there's some there's some funny parts of that movie that I I think are classic. So Christopher Walken was another great addition as well. Okay, so another honorable mention, um, and this did not make my list because it is an R-rated movie that no one should probably watch, but I thought it was a really funny sequel another 48 hours did you ever see either of the 48 hours movie? yeah, yeah. so i have them right here oh, okay so eddie murphy and nick nolte uh i thought in some ways the second movie was even funnier than the first um but for those of you who don't know what it's about nick nolte's a cop and he's chasing a drug dealer and then the first movie he picks up uh, eddie murphy because eddie murphy uh, who was in prison, he gets him out of prison to help him find this drug dealer. And uh, there's a bag of, you know, a big bag of cash involved and all this other stuff. And uh, they're able to catch the bad guy and he goes back to prison. He's six months from prison, and, or for, it's from the end of his prison sentence, but he gets out for these 48 hours to help Nick Nolte. And it's really funny. The second one, he gets released. We find out that actually he ended up having to serve another five years because another drug dealer, a more important drug dealer, had actually framed him to stay in five years because he could identify who the Iceman was. So when he comes out, Nick Nolte finds him again to help him find the Iceman. And so it happens again. It's another 48 hours, and it's really hilarious. But uh, R-rated specifically because there's just a ton of cussing in it. Um, I think you know what's funny? I just noticed... I didn't really know, pay attention. Those movies were eight years apart. Did you realize yeah. that? Yeah. Did you realize that? From yeah. 82 all the way till 1990. That's crazy. That's great, though. Yeah, so that's my other honorable mention. Um, one other one real quick, and I just want to mention quickly, Return to Oz. I don't know if you ever saw the Return to Oz movie. I thought was it was... the one with the... Um, scare, with the... the scare, yeah, it wasn't Scarecrow. Was the other thing that was like the Scarecrow? Well, they had like a robot type thing with her. Um, she was trying to find the scarecrow because the scarecrow had been captured by the sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jack. It was Jack. It was the pumpkin head guy. It was the other character. Right. Yeah. yeah, that was good. Um, really good. Yeah, it was kind of scary. The yeah. beginning was horrifying. Yeah, very scary. You had to suspend some disbelief because this Dorothy was a lot younger than Julie Andrews was in the first one. So that was kind of confusing, but still a really good movie. I think that not a lot of people have seen it. If you get a chance, if you like The Wizard of Oz, you could, you're okay suspending your disbelief a little bit. Uh, you'll you'll enjoy that movie. So, okay. But no and, musical. There's no songs in it, if I remember. No music. Yeah, it's not a musical. Number one movie. Can you guess what it is? What my number one is? 
Um, you already said, uh, well, you didn't put Major League on there. That's what I thought you would do. And you already said Rocky, so no. Karate Kid 2. Oh, jeez. Where was, what was I thinking? <laughs> underappreciated? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm with you. Go ahead. I think this is the most underrated sequel of all. Because I have seen a number of people say that they don't like it. They don't think it was good. I don't understand why. I it's I think it's the most watchable of all of the original three. It's really entertaining because Mr. Miyagi is clearly the most intriguing character of the entire series, period the end. I mean, Daniel is interesting and he's he's a lovable character and we like him, but Mr. Miyagi is the character that makes the karate kid such a great movie. And that is as you eloquently put it, Tim, which is rare. Uh <laughs> Uh, that this is Mr. Miyagi's story and you get to learn a lot of the background. It goes to Okinawa. I thought that the stakes in the fight with Chosen at the end were so much higher. And Mr. So Mr. Miyagi is the reason for that. And it's it, what's amazing is the writing is so good. One line made it serious. When he goes out there, he goes, he goes, Daniel, this is not the tournament. This is for real. You know what I mean? Like the stakes are so high. Like this is literally a fight to the death that he's getting into. And, and the buildup with with that leading into that, the music and everything, even from the very beginning when he was like, oh, this was over a girl. And he was like, oh, just because he left his honor and everything is like and he's like falling asleep on the plane and all of those conversations. And but he was just like, you know, in Okinawa honors, very is very serious. You know, he's just like he's like, Danny, you don't understand the gravity of the situation, like the whole time building up to it. And then and the music just always chimed in all those moments with Sato. And then even when they healed their relationship and Chosen bounces back in, it was just much more intense than the first one. As we yeah. talked about, there was, yeah. it wasn't life and death in any of the moments in the first one. And, um, and, but this one, like, it was several times. And I would say the score for part two is better than any sequel score I could think of. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. Bill Conti, yeah. I mean, Bill, yeah. Bill Conti is so great. He, he does, anytime he was involved with the Rocky movies, the score was awesome. Anytime he was involved with the Karate Kid, it was awesome. Uh, you know, I felt like this movie really was right on par with the first one. And for some reason, some people some people just don't like it at all. And a lot of people will crap all over both sequels. And I think it's, I mean, it's obviously canon in Cobra Kai. Um, so... Uh, you know, I, and I love all the characters. I thought all the characters were great. I also loved Yukie, um, even though she didn't have as much of an important role per se in part two as Ali played in part one. Yukie was, I thought, more of an intriguing love interest than Ali was. I thought that the connection between him and Yukie was much stronger than it was between him and Ali. So. Talking about Daniel, I thought Yukie was the was Miyagi's girlfriend. No, you're right, not Yukie, uh, Kumiko. Kumiko, yeah. Kumiko. I, I couldn't remember her name. I was like, no, Yuki is the. I thought you were talking about him and and uh, Miyagi, and I was like, we have. Dan Daniel and Kumiko, I felt their connection felt yeah. much more real and stronger to me. Yeah. Than Daniel and Ali's. Um, but both of Ali and Kumiko had something in common. Their uh, exit from the story was just a fast write-off line in the following movie that happened both times. So, yeah, and, and that you know, with with the alley, with Ali, I think it made a lot of sense to do it the way that they did it because, uh, I mean, it, it made more sense to me in part two when I saw it when he said, "Oh, she's falling in love with some football player and all that." Okay, great, that was fine. But Kumiko, when she didn't show up in part three. I was like, okay, well, I thought this was true freaking love. Like, she gave you the tea and all that crap. And Miyagi and, y and Yukie did that. They've been in love, you know, Miyagi's clearly been in love with her for 50 years. And she just decided to go take a dance scholarship in oh, China. some ballet class, yeah. And he was like, they have it in freaking in California. Like she, was, she was straight ready to leave Okinawa and come to California with Daniel. And then in part three, they're just like, oh, well. Yeah, she just got this dance scholarship and she just couldn't pass it up. So, what? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, I, was, I agree. That was dumb. Your life. He literally saved your life. The guy had a switchblade to your neck and he went and sacrificed his own life and beat the crap out of Chosen to save you and you go and take a dance scholarship. Like, that's ridiculous. And I know Allie, what's her name? She didn't want to come back from the sec, if I remember right. 
or they wrote it out. But the third one, can you imagine if the third one, if that was Kumiko with him the entire time instead oh, of what, that yeah. other Disney girl? It would have been just as good or, and way better for her to be there. She could have had the exact same script almost, other than talking about her ex-boyfriend and stuff, and had her be there at the dance and have they, they went dancing. Then the third one, they go dancing, going to the club, getting in the fight with uh, Silver's paid off bully and then um when they're in the pottery shop and they come in be beating him up she's been there for him before with that like it would have been just as good only meaningful to have this person in his life continuing on you know and that's something that the channel or maybe so one of our our watch our listeners or our watchers or whatever you viewers whatever you want to call yourselves um <laughs> if, if somebody knows why kumiko was not included in part three because i have not seen that actress in anything else that I can remember. So I'm curious why she was not included in part three. Cause you're right. Like if she was the love interest in part three, cause the part three love interest wasn't even really a love interest. Like she was a love it was interest. It just a girl. It was a placeholder for a, a character. Yeah. Like if they would have had Kumiko in there, the stakes would have been so much stronger. And could you have imagined how much more you would hate Mike Barnes if some of the stuff that they did to her would have happened? He kicked her. He kicked, kicked her that girl. He kicked her yeah. right in the stomach and knocked her down. Yeah. Oh, he, that would have been, yeah. There's also a threat. He also threatened to rape her. Like, like, yep. Yep. You know, holy cow. You know what I mean? Uh, and now, that was all intense for, for her. But imagine if it was Kumiko who had just been through all that stuff in Okinawa and now she comes to the States and it's like, you know, this is what she's getting. It would have been so much better. So, I, anyway. Wow. But back that's to now my wish. Like, that's my wish list for Karate Kid re remake. <laughs> Yeah. If she had been in the third one, that would probably would have saved. Honestly, there was a lot of people that thought it was just recycled the third one from the second one or from the first one. But I bet if Kumiko was in it, I bet you a lot of people like it better. Not just because they like her, but you're right. It would have changed the entire at atmosphere and the tone of everything to a, a more realistic um, intensity that wasn't there. <sighs> you know what? That's it. If anybody goes to a panel, with Ralph Macchio or the creators of Cobra Kai, please ask that question and send us the YouTube video of what the answer is. Cause I want to know now why Kumiko is not involved. And I've never even thought about it. And if I ever go to a panel, I'm going to ask. In fact, yep. I'm going to Twitter the creators tonight. So that would have been such a better movie. It really would. Just yeah, that right. one little element, just to bring it, just spark it on, connect it all. It really did. It felt like a detached, even though you brought Priest back, whatever. We can talk about it forever. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that was it. Credit Kid 2, number one. It's a clear number one for me. The rest of them, I felt like the the order could have changed. I wasn't really strong in my order, um, but those are my, my movies. So I'm happy with Crocodile Dundee being my number one because a lot of people don't even remember it. A lot of people don't really care about it. People that do remember it. And it's a really well done movie. And it's just as enjoyable, if not more so, than the first one. And people, some people still remember Crocodile Dundee, but... I don't think people even credited that that franchise by itself, but yeah, I'm happy with it being my number one. So there you go, Crocodile Dundee and and Karate Kid Two. So I think if we're going to do an epilogue to this, I think that we both have homework to do, and that is I have to go see uh, Cro Crocodile Dundee Two. Um, yeah, I watch the first one again first. Watch yeah, them both. I will, and then I think that you need to see Vegas Vacation, and uh, and also I would encourage you to watch Ghoulies Two. I thought you wanted me to watch Be Cool. That too. Yeah. <laughs> you got a lot more homework than me. So <laughs> All I right. got two movies to watch. You've got three. Or four if you decide to watch the original Ghoulies, but you don't really have yeah. Vegas Vacation, Ghoulies too. But yeah, I gotta watch the first Ghoulies too. Yeah, you, you don't have to, to to enjoy the second one. And the thing I'm is gonna. you gotta also understand Ghoulies is one of those low budget horror comedies they're pg-13 so they're totally okay to watch for anybody really unless you're not a horror fan and it's like i said it's a horror comedy thing it's not super scary it's really more funny yeah. scary. so okay we'll do let's let's put some homework out there we'll do it and come back and do an epilogue episode but in the meantime if you guys have any other um thoughts on movies that are underrated or if you disagree with our list if you think that we were um, over glorifying some of these movies and giving too much credit or if you don't think they were even underrated and people everyone likes it then uh, let us know tell us in the comments below all right well that's a that's it great episode great top seven uh mine's better than tim's as always 
Um, but uh, other than that, thanks for watching. We appreciate it. And for Saints on Cinema, I'm Josh Edlow. And I am Tim Wilde with The Better List. Thanks for watching Saints on Cinema. This is this uh... <laughs> Should we try that again? <laughs> I liked it. All right.